This summer at Heritage, we've been in a series called Summer Soundtrack, and we're continuing that today. Uh, And the reason why we are calling it Summer Soundtrack is, firstly, it's summer, and secondly, because good or bad, every season of life can be summarized in a song. And right in the middle of the Bible, we're given a songbook full of verses and choruses to, uh, that capture the human experience, and they all remind us of one very important reality, that we are not alone, that we're not alone, uh, that the, the word psalm, which is uh, the book that I'm talking about, uh, the word psalm actually means song. And in, in the book of Psalms, right in the middle of the Bible, uh, we, we find these songs and these verses, these lyrics. There are around 150 of these uh, captured for us in the book of Psalm. They've been sung at festivals and weddings, funerals, and throughout life. And the majority of them are credited to be written by a man named David. Now, David, if you're not familiar with who he is, uh, he's maybe best known for his accomplishments as a little boy. Kind of like this little guy. What's up, dude? Can you wave? I love it. And when David was a little boy, he took a slingshot and he slayed a giant named Goliath. And, uh, and then from there, you know, he's, he's, he's anointed to be king, but he's not king yet. And so many of the Psalms that we look at are reflections and moments of David and his life experience. And the Psalms tend to come alive in a whole different way when we understand the backstory behind them, when we understand the person writing them and the things that they're going through. And, and that's what we are going to look at a little bit today. So many of the songs reflect the dark moments of David's life as he's hiding out in caves and on the run as the Israeli army is chasing him down, seeking to kill him. And, and the Psalms that he writes in that period of his life Check this out. They're known as the Psalms of the Outlaw. Come on, that, that's like a great title for, for a movie, don't you think? Like the Songs of the Outlaw. I, want, I mean, if you can make a movie with the title Monkey Man, I, I think this is way better. The Songs of the Outlaw. Uh, today, however, I want to look at one of the Psalms that David writes after he becomes king. And when he becomes king, Life doesn't all get perfect for him just because he's got the power and authority. In fact, the psalm we're looking at today, uh, Psalm 3, records the song that David writes after he is older and he's got some kids and his oldest son now is chasing him and trying to kill him and take over his throne. Talk about some messed up family dynamics. And one of the things we find in Psalm 3 is something that impacts all of us. One of the things we see here is whether you're young or old, rich or poor, no matter what your background is or season of life, every one of us experiences fear. I wanted to just take some time today to talk about fear. The fears that we face, the fears we experience. It's no coincidence that the most repeated command in all of the Bible is do not fear. Do not fear. More than anything else, God tells us, do not be afraid. He says it to a man named Moses when Moses leads the Israelite people out of slavery in Egypt. His successor, Joshua, God sends message to him and says, don't be afraid as he leads them into the promised land. God tells Mary, do not be afraid when she finds out that she is going to give birth to the Son of God. Jesus tells his disciples over and over and over, don't be afraid. Why are you so afraid? Don't be afraid. Why is this the most repeated command throughout the Bible? Because God knows how easy it is for us to become fearful. Of all sorts of things in life, just look at the world that we live in. Look at the things happening this week with technology and things crashing, the wars and the natural disasters increasing, our cultural differences, economy and and politics. Just last week, our former president, with an assassination attempt. And now here's the deal. I, I, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, who you vote for, what your political bend is. Wrong is wrong. And what we see in our world today is people reacting and responding to their fears. 
to the things that captivate their hearts and cause them to be afraid, the fear of the unknown, the fear of losing control. And there are three main responses when it comes to our fear. If you're anything like me, they tend to be masks that we put on to to hide our fears. Here's the first one. If you're taking notes, you can write them down, or maybe you can just identify the mask that fits you best in hiding your fears. The first mask is anger. See, anger tends to be a mask for our fears. Anger is just a counterfeit uh, version of strength hiding the fact that I'm afraid. Anger is my response over over reaction to not getting my own way. It's fear. So often, anger becomes the mask to hide my fear. Or here's the second one. How about how about this one? Control. And I'm going to make a plan, and I'm going to I'm going to have everything perfect, and I'm going to organize it. I'm going to have it all laid out, and I'm going to I'm going to take control of it. My fears. Well, if I can control them, then I can manage them and I can deal with them. Or here's the last one, avoidance. Avoidance. If I can't control it, I'll just avoid it. I'll pretend it doesn't exist. I'll bury my head in the sand. I'll doom scroll on my social media at the things that make me laugh or feel good. I'll just bury myself in nine seasons of suits on Netflix. Like, I'll just avoid it. When fear grabs hold, it can render the best advice, the best ideas, my best intentions, the purpose of my existence useless when fear grabs hold and begins to lead my life. Last week uh, at our service, we, we didn't take a chance to do this, but I wanted to take a chance here in the park with old friends and new friends with people that are curious about church, with people that were just walking by with their dog and took a seat and listening in, and we're so glad that you're here, but I wanted to take a chance to pause and pray over our nation, to pray for what's going on in in our political uh, realm, in our world, and all that's happening around us. So would you join me for a moment as we pray for the world, for our nation, for our government, Would you pray with me, Heavenly Father? We come before you today, humbly asking for your guidance and blessing over our nation. In these times of uncertainty and division, we pray that you would bring unity and peace, that you'd bring wisdom to our leaders and to all the people in our land. Oh God, we recognize that apart from you, we can't do anything. We acknowledge that our hope and our strength must come from you and you alone. We ask that you would grant our leaders the courage to make difficult decisions, the humility to seek your counsel, and the discernment to know what is right and true. We ask that you would heal the wounds that have divided us, restore civility and respect in our political discourse. May we remember that we are created in your image and that we are all called to love one another, even those whom we disagree with. God, would you bless our nation? Would you bless and watch over those who have lost loved ones in the most recent attacks? God, would you protect our leaders? Would you lead them and guide them in Jesus' name? Amen. Listen, God knows how devastating fear can be when it takes hold in our lives. And when fear is cultivated, it renders courage useless. See, just like fear, courage is also contagious. Which is why we're told in 2 Timothy 1.7 that God gave us a spirit not of fear, but a spirit of power a spirit of love, a spirit of self-control. Not to be led by my fears, but to be led by his spirit at work in me, that when God is working in me, he, he is building and strengthening my courage to face the uncertainties, the challenges, the hardships of life, not with fear, but with courageous faith in an all-powerful and perfect God. 
And that's exactly what we see David doing in Psalm chapter 3. And if you've got a Bible, you can uh, turn to Psalm chapter 3. If you've got that QR code, you can scan that. There's a Bible button. The passage is there. Psalm chapter 3, we see three truths about fear. Three truths that we're going to take the rest of our time here uh, this morning to unpack a little bit. Here's what we're going to look at. What does fear do? What does God do? And what can I do? What does fear do? What does God do? What can I do? And so many of the Psalms that David writes give an honest reflection in the midst of uh, him being hunted and the struggle in his life. But this Psalm, this song that he writes in the midst of being hunted, it might surprise you. He starts off like this in verse one. He says, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Do you hear the hopelessness in this statement? Now, David isn't buying into it, but he's given us an honest perspective of the situation he finds himself in. All the voices around him, all his counselors, all the people, the rest of his family, everyone's telling him, you don't have a chance. You, 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 can't, you, can't, you can't get away with this. Give up now. There's no hope for you. And if David let it, the fear could grab hold and take him down. And this is the first truth. This is what fear does. Fear will always try to break me. Fear will always try to break me. Fear will always try to take me out. And there is a real enemy of our soul, the ruler of this world, Satan himself, who's always trying to attack and come after and destroy. He uses culture. He uses people. He uses circumstances and substances. They're like the foes that David talks about. How many are my foes? How many are coming against me and telling me there's no hope, trying to destroy me? I don't know about you, but it seems like there is an endless number of forces trying to do the same thing in our lives, trying to paralyze me to render me useless and ineffective in this world, ineffective in my home, ineffective in culture, and ineffective in the work and the ministry that God has called all of us to. See, the reality is, is that you and I, we were all made on purpose and for a purpose. But there is an enemy, and he will stop at nothing to make you ineffective, because here's the thing, he knows that if he can get us afraid, he knows if he can get me afraid, he can break my courage. If he can get me to live in fear, then then I won't be living by faith. If he can let me, get me to live in fear, I won't be living with bold and courageous courage. That's what fear does. But look at what David says next, check this out. But you, O Lord. Now there are some great buts in the Bible, and this is one of them. Nobody? I thought at least that would get the kids laughing. Forget it, forget it. David says, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me. You're my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Now, now I need some help. Are there, I need three kids to come up here and help me. First three kids right up here, go. Come on. There's one. There's two, there's three, got three. Come on up here, guys. Hey, can we give these kids a hand? Right up here, right in front. Right in front, oh, I love it. All right, here's the deal. What David is saying is there are so many things coming to attack me. There are so many things coming after me. You just hold that. Here, you hold that one. You boys come over here. Yep. Yeah, right there's good, right there. And, and just hold it like that. You can hold this right over his head, right over here. They're all coming at you. All the attacks are coming at us. And David's saying, how many are, are these attacks? How many are my foes? How long will they last? All of this is right. There's no salvation. The attack is so dooming, and it's going to get me. But you, O oh Lord, but you, Lord, are a shield about me. Yeah, you get the coolest one. Check this out. Those attacks got nothing on you. And though they're coming, David says, but I have a shield. I have a protector. It's 
the picture of God's protection in the midst of a world that is attacking and throwing things at us and trying to get me to live in fear. The Lord is a shield. See, fear may try to break me, but my God is a protector. Fear may try to break me, but my God will protect me. He is a shield protecting me against the attacks of the enemy. And David's like, fear, you can't break me because my God is a shield protecting me. And this is what it looks like. Now, the reality is, is that the dangers and the fears coming at us, they don't always look like nine millimeters or poison tip darts or, right? They're a little bit more obscure. The addiction, the worry, the anger, compromising my character, giving in to, uh, or giving up on what is true, pursuing pleasure at all costs, unfaithful in my marriage, giving in to peer pressure, letting culture shape and determine what I believe, the lies and the pressure and the, guys, what's it like? It's like attacking me, right? It's coming after me. Like arrows and like bullets attacking our identity and our purpose, our value, and our beliefs. But what if we had protection against those attacks? What if we had a shield to protect us from those threats? David tells us where to find that protection. He says, God, you're my shield. God, you're my protector. And whatever the enemy throws at me, whatever the enemy tries to attack me with, whatever fears come my way, I have a God who is with me, who is my shield and protector and defender. Amen? Hey, can we give these kids a hand? Great job, guys. No, I was not going to let you actually attack her. Are you crazy? Go grab a seat. Here's the thing. David's not done yet. Verse 5, he goes on, he says, I lay down and sleep, and I woke up again, for the Lord sustained me. I wonder, are you someone that loses sleep because of worry and anxiety and being afraid? See, I, I get it, the circumstances of life, the seasons we face, navigating it all, it can cause us to be afraid. But David says, you know what, even when I'm at my most vulnerable, when I lay down to sleep, I'm not afraid because my God sustains me. He watches over me. If you're anything like me at the end of your day, you're pretty exhausted, right? Chasing the kids, doing the house chores, the responsibilities at work, job stress, cleaning, organizing, all of it. You crawl into bed with a sigh of relief. When we were all created to accomplish things, we were all created to work. Life is exhausting, which is why David reminds us, you know what, I can't do enough. There's, there's not enough I can accomplish in, the, in a day to be good enough. Remember, David is on the run for his life as his oldest son is trying to kill him and take over his throne. No amount of strategy is, is, is going to be clever enough. No amount of control is going to be enough for David to get out of it. While sleep is important, no amount of sleep is going to solve my problems. Which is why David isn't resting or relying on his sleep to get, get him through and keep him going. No, he says, God is the one who sustains me. That I find rest and I find peace in the, in the matchless power of God who watches over me. See, despite the situation David is in, despite all the things coming against him, David's not controlled by fear. He's not masking it with anger or control or avoidance. Rather, it is his unwavering faith in God that brings him courage and hope, even with all sorts of enemies seeking to destroy him, which is why in verse 6 he says, I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid of many thousands, right? This isn't like just a handful of guys coming to like pick on him and bully him and try to beat him up a little bit. He says, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid of thousands of military forces and people who have set themselves against me and all around. I will not be afraid. 
And we all have those moments where we feel like the whole world is crumbling around us, where everyone's against us, nothing is going as planned. And while much of our life is out of our control, fear doesn't have to be the response to the political climate, to the wars in our world, to the economy, or to the natural disasters or the circumstance that you're facing today. Life will always throw curveballs at us. And while we may feel like it at times, the reality is, is none of us have uh, military forces coming to try to destroy us. At least not yet. But we do have real things that bring us fear. Real masks that we put on to hide that fear. And I wonder what it would look like if we were to take a quick inventory of our fears and just think for a moment, what am I afraid of? What causes me the most concern? What's, what's my biggest insecurity? That fear, that insecurity, that worry, left unchecked, will break you. It'll break your marriage. It'll break you as a parent. It'll break you in your productivity at work. It'll break you in your everyday life. Your fear will cripple you from taking action and living with any kind of purpose. So I want to get really practical as we begin to just kind of wrap up here. See, if fear is always trying to break me, and God is the one who protects me, what am I supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? If fear's trying to break me, God wants to protect me, what do I do? Well, we don't see David masking with anger, control, or avoidance in verse 4. In verse 4, he says, I cry out to the Lord. He answers me from his holy, from his holy hill. What do I do? I, I got to seek after the Lord. I love this. David doesn't say, when I'm afraid, I'll try to trust God more. When I'm afraid, I'll I'll try to be better. I'll try to do more. I'll try. No, no, no. David says, "I I just won't be afraid. Why? Why can he be so confident? Because he's already determined who his God is. He's already determined the source of strength and power that he will rely on. So no matter what comes his way, he says, I won't be afraid. Not I'll try to not be afraid. No, no, I won't be afraid because my God is bigger. Because my God is stronger, I trust and believe in the power of my God. The author of Hebrews highlights this same truth as he reminds us of God's promise that says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can culture do to me? What can this world do to me? If my God is for me, who can be against me? I don't know about your kids, but my kids are notorious for being afraid, especially at night, afraid of the dark, afraid of things. Kids are notorious for being afraid at night. I've had all of my kids at some point, some of them still, in the middle of the night, come into my room, stand over me while I'm sleeping. I can't sleep. I'm afraid. And I wake up in a panic as they're poking me or staring over me in the dark, these half-asleep zombie kids. I'm, like, stressing out. Here's the deal. As much as I want to tell them, just go back to bed. Stop being afraid. Instead of telling them that their fear is not justified, Or, hey, don't be afraid, just go back to bed. I've told my kids the same thing that David is showing us here. I remind my kids what David is reminding us of. Remember who is stronger. Remember who is bigger than what you are afraid of right now. Because telling someone to not be afraid is like telling a blind person, hey, 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 open your eyes. It doesn't work. At least it's only worked when one person has ever done that. His name is Jesus. Fear is real until we remember who is greater and who is stronger than the things that we are afraid of. I want to point my kids to grow their trust in God who is bigger and stronger than the attacks that may come against them. Because it is when I see God as greater that my fears become lesser. And this is what David models for us. When fear tries to break me, my God can protect me, so I will trust in God. How do I battle the fears that I face? I put my trust in the one who is stronger and bigger than whatever comes my way, 
the one who is a shield who protects me because as my trust in God grows, my fears in life shrink. As my trust in God grows, my fears in life shrinks. And, and I know that there are people around right now, people listening to my voice that, that don't maybe know what it means to trust in God, that don't know what it looks like to, to have him as your protector. And so I just I hope this makes it maybe a little clearer because this book that God has given us, the Bible, it reveals the purpose and the plan of a powerful and holy God who loved you so much that he, he has stopped at nothing to rescue you, to protect you from the dangers of living in a fallen, broken, and evil world. And the message of the whole Bible is, is really simple. It reveals who God is. The message of the whole Bible is this, that God loves you but that there is a real evil that has infected all of us and in so doing has separated us from that love of God. But because he loves you, he sent his son Jesus on a special ops reconnaissance rescue mission to save anyone who would put their faith and trust in him. But that means every single one of us has a choice to make to choose the rescue of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins, for the, to rescue me from the fears of my life and the, the risk of eternity without a heavenly father or to reject his saving work on the cross and allow fear and danger and the evil of this world to lead and guide my life. What God makes clear in his word is that for whoever embraces his son, Jesus, who believes in him, puts their trust in his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of their sins, that God restores us back into relationship with him. That evil is broken. That fear is broken. And God becomes my protector, my rescuer, and restores me. And if you've never made that choice to surrender your life to Jesus, to receive his protection for your eternity, I invite you to make that choice today. To put your trust in Jesus as the only one who can protect your life and your eternity. Because we're more than flesh and bone. We are all spiritual beings, which means we will all live forever. We don't need to chase the fountain of youth. We will all live forever. The only question is, is where will I spend eternity? With my God and protector, who gives me hope in life, or separated from him, with our arch enemy, the devil, who just seeks to kill, devour, and destroy. The choice is yours. God tells us that all who believe in Jesus will be saved, that if we confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. So I invite you, if you've never made that choice, to make that choice today. And you can make that choice and make this your prayer between you and God right now. Say something like this. Say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe in Jesus, that he's your son, that he died for my sin, and that you raised him back to life. I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as the Lord of my life from this day forward. Would you guide me and help me do your will? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you made that decision today, if you, that was your choice, it is the most important choice you will ever make. You've invited, you've invited God to, to be your protector, your shield and defender against the fears and attack that are coming. You're giving your life to a God who gives you purpose and hope. 
Now, if you are a follower of Jesus, and for some of you, maybe that just happened, here's what this means for us. The state of our world is not an excuse to get angry. To mask my fear by standing behind some anger or... The state of our world is not some excuse to just try to control everything and manage it and figure it out on my own. And it's certainly not an excuse to avoid it and to sit back and let somebody else fight fight the battle. That God has given every one of us a mission to help people find and follow Jesus because he is the hope that we have, the shield and defender that we have against a world that is attacking and trying to get us to live in fear. Fear will try to break me. My God is my protector. I trust in him. David wraps it all up. He wraps up this song with this cry of faith over fear as he trusts and hopes in God who defeats his enemies. Verse 7 says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you strike all the enemies on the cheek and you break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord and no one else. Your blessing be on your people. What have you put your trust in? What have you put your hope in to battle the fears that life is throwing at you? What are you relying on to save you from the attacks and circumstances that are coming to break you? See, if you trust in yourself, if you trust in other people, it'll always lead to uncertainty and fear. Just look at the world that we live in. But if you put your trust in Jesus, it'll always lead to greater faith and increased hope. I wanna invite you to put your faith in the protection and hope that comes through a relationship with God through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. See, what power would fear have over you? i just end with this. Maybe there's some real fears that have come to mind. What power would that fear have over you? If you stopped telling God how big your problems are and you started telling your problems how big your God is, Because when I shift my focus to someone who is bigger and greater, stronger than the fears that may come my way, I have hope and protection from a God who is with me, who will never leave me, who will strengthen me, who is greater than my fears, and the only one who can save me. So I hope you will put your faith and trust in Jesus today. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your servant, David, who in the midst of life and circumstance had every reason to be afraid, but instead fixed his eyes on you, a powerful God who is greater than any fear that may come or attack in this life. Would you give us courage and faith to trust in you, that others would see the hope that we have in a broken and hurting world that hope would be found as we follow you in Jesus name Amen